Good afternoon. Marcia, welcome to the OVC Oral History Project. Uh, to start, I'd just like you to say your name and spell it, please. It's Marcia Blackstock, M-A-R-C-I-A-B-L-A-C-K-S-T-O-C-K. -A -A -C -C -C. Great. Well, let's start at the beginning. How or why did you get involved in the crime victims movement? Um, I was looking for a place to volunteer. I had a full-time job but wanted to do some volunteer work and was really looking for an agency that um, was really dealing with some serious women's issues. And so I found Bay Area Women Against Rape, and I started there as a volunteer. What was Bay, what was, we're gonna refer to Bay Area Women Against Rape with its acronym, mm -hmm. um, and call it BAYWAR. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me a little bit about BAYWAR, the history of BAYWAR? How did BAYWAR start? BAYWAR got started back in 1971, um, and it was started as a direct result of a way a young high school student, a Berkeley high school student, was treated um, after she was raped um, in the stairwell of the campus. Um, she did come home and tell her foster mother at that time, um, and the foster mother called the Berkeley Police Department to take a report, and then she, the young woman was isolated at the Berkeley Police Department for over eight hours um, and not having anyone allowed in to interact with her, no family members, no friends. Um, and from there, they transported her to Alta Gates Hospital, um, where they also kept her isolated for hours on end um, from anyone. And partly that was because n nobody knew what they were doing. It was not really um, common to have a lot of rape reports being made back at that time. Uh, they were dealing with a child, and, and everybody was anxious about what they were doing. Um, but because of that, this woman's foster mother, um, Olita Abrams, became really outraged at the kind of treatment that her daughter had received. Um, and so she got together with a few women um, and decided that they needed to come together and do something to make a difference. Um, and so they started the agency with two goals. Um, the first was to have a place where sexual assault survivors could come to for and receive good understanding counseling and have a place that was safe for them had people that were trained to act as advocates for them when they had to or chose to leave the system. Um, and the second goal was to do a lot of community education, to really get out into the, the uh, police departments and the courts and the hospitals and the businesses and the neighborhoods, the schools, and talk to people about what rape really was, what sexual assault really was, and to try to start chipping away at all of the huge misconceptions uh, that society held back at that time about sexual assault and about who was sexually assaulted. How did they get it going? That's a big, a big challenge for three women who get together to work on something. Mm -hmm. It was a huge challenge. Um, they were very determined. They at one point hooked up with the Berkeley Women's Health Collective and they um, helped get them some support. Um, we had one person in particular, Dick Eichelhart, who was the Alameda County District Attorney at the time, who was um, very sympathetic to the issue, really believed in the cause, and was an integral force in our being able to start working our way into system-oriented places. Um, but it was hard, and it was a struggle, and there was no money. You know, it was the good old kitchen table <laughs> uh, operation. Um, but they were determined and they were not going to be stopped. What about the Baywar protests? The Baywar protests? Well, the, you talking about protesting, what, what would be, how would one of the protests take place in the public place? Right. Mainly when the protests were coming about was in, in um, oh. reaction to some mistreatment. So, you know, they would be in front of the police department or, you know, they would be in front of some city office and trying to call attention to the fact that what had occurred was inappropriate and, and trying to, you know, reinforce through very loud voices that there was a new way of looking at things and that people needed to pay attention. And was the environment of the protest deceptive? Um, no. I, I, <laughs> I um, well, I think protests were really valuable um, as a way of building community um, for the, the women that were in the movement and trying to start the movement and push the movement. Um, it was very invigorating and empowering. Um, I personally, and there may be some other women early on in Baywar who would disagree with me, I personally don't think that 
the protests did a lot to win over um, system-oriented people that we were trying to uh, convince that they needed to hear what we had to say. What was the field of victims' rights and services like when, when you entered as a volunteer? Well, I came in um, to the effort um, seven years after it started, um, and it still was extremely adversarial. Um, there was not much um, positive connection still between, let's say, law enforcement and Bay War. Um, we had better community support. Um, I think we had won over a lot of individual people within the community, but still there was a huge adversarial relationship going on between especially law enforcement um, and hospital and court systems. Um, so there's a lot of distrust. Um, we were not trusted <coughs> for our views, and we didn't trust um, basically anyone within the system to do what we thought they needed to be doing. So it was um, a very a lot of upheaval, a lot of anxiety and frustration and, and distrust. Who became some of the allies in the community for Bay War? For example, were um, women uh, students at the universities um, coming on board for the protests or volunteering, or were there other organizations that sort of came together to support Bay War? Um, there was a, certainly, like I said, a lot of community support, and always to this day, half of our volunteer force is university women, um, because we do have a lot of colleges and universities right around us. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were other collective kinds of groups because they were started as a collective, such as the, as I said, the Berkeley Women's Health Collective, um, the Berkeley Free Clinic. I mean, other small groups that. Um, that we were all, in one respect, kind of fighting for the same thing, um, to ensure that people were treated with respect and dignity and that their needs were being met. Um, so we were all coming together, but I think in the, the, you know, what was started in the larger picture to get more response um, in the system, which is where we were really fighting to get the response, there really were just, you know, individual people who were willing to say, wait a minute, <laughs> This makes some sense. Maybe we need to hear this out. And one of those, as I said, was Dick Eichelhart um, from the Alameda County District Attorney's Office. There would be individual police officers um, in departments that would say, you know, okay, I'm going to listen to you, and then I'm going to try to buck all of the stuff I'm getting from all of my coworkers um, and try to help get you in the door. Um, so it really took a lot of people collaborating um, and trying to come together. Are there other people <coughs> that really stand out as allies in the movement? Um, there were other crisis centers that became allies in the movement. Um, mm -hmm. Our name being Bay Area Women Against Rape um, is that name because when we started we were it. And we were trying to serve a very wide geographic area being the Bay Area of California. Um, but we were quick to uh, offer training to other groups in other counties close by that were starting up um, and wanting to start their own rape crisis centers. So very early on, in the early 70s, we formed the um, Bay Area Rape Crisis Coalition. This was before there was a state coalition where the individual rape crisis centers would come together and we would talk about you know, what we were offering, what services we needed to include, how were you know, how was this agency getting into their police department and this agency was getting stalled out? What could we do to help each other? Um, so we kind of came together, and that was the, the biggest support system back in those days. <coughs> when you make something out of nothing and start at the beginning, you, and you, you become the source of the training, how did, how did the training uh, develop? I mean, how did, was it a trial and error, or were you just very clear about the goals that you wanted people to learn? Well, I, I need to say, you know, like I said already, that I came in late, yeah. so I was not uh, um, involved in the integral part of the training, and when I came in, I already received an amazing training. But I think the training evolved out of really taking a serious look at what's going on for sexual assault survivors, um, what emotional needs do they have, what support do they need, what do they need if they're going to enter into the system. Um, what do we need to, you know, have available to them? 
and and we took a very broad approach at you know trying to think of every imaginable um, impact that a survivor could be impacted with. I guess a good statement, mm -hmm. um, you know, and brought that into the training as well. So we were looking at suicide, and we were looking at drug abuse, and we were looking at incest, and you know we were looking at every imaginable thing that could impact the emotional health and healing of a sexual assault survivor and brought that into one comprehensive training. Um, and the training has expanded greatly mm -hmm. um, since the beginning. In your area of uh, victim assistance, what was the greatest challenge you and your colleagues faced in affecting, affecting change? I think um, the biggest challenge when I look back on it was we were coming from a um, peer support, community-based, grassroots organizing that brought in a huge variety of people from a variety of backgrounds and educations and ideas, but all coming together and focusing on a, a common goal. But we were considered peer and not professional and at best paraprofessional and rarely that. Um, so there became this huge um, adversarial relationship between the professionals in the community from the therapists, law enforcement officers, uh, people within the judicial system, uh, hospital personnel. They were the experts. They were the professionals. They were the people with all of the degrees behind their name. And we were viewed as um, threatening to them. Mm. Um, not knowledgeable, even though we were the only ones with the knowledge, <laughs> um, and not trained. And so what we had to say to them was not valid and inconsequential. How does that play itself out in a situation? Could you kind of give an example? Um, just constantly being put down for who we were. I mean, <laughs> I remember sitting in a very early on meeting with law enforcement trying to convince them one, that they needed to have a sexual assault unit, and two, they needed to get some training. And, and I had this, this uh, sergeant in the police department just look at me with all this anger in his face, and he said, look, we know who you women are. <laughs> and I said, oh, really? And who are we? Mm. And he said, you're all barefoot, brazen, braless, lesbian, harried leg hippie women carrying placards. Wow. <laughs> And I just kind of looked at him and went, I shaved my legs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was like so <laughs> taken aback by that statement. But I think what he stated was true in his mind. And I think that how he was perceiving us was how a large percentage of people within the professionals community were perceiving us. And it took a lot of effort and persistence and courage to keep going in and getting that kind of attack yeah. um, and not going, oh yeah, <laughs> you know, well you want to know what you are, yeah. um, which is really what you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so I think that was the biggest obstacle. Just could you give me a little feedback about the counselor uh, sort of competitive attitude where the, the, the licensed counselor who felt that they were more knowledgeable but probably maybe had no experience? They most of the time had no experience. Um, they were very knowledgeable people who were very ignorant around sexual assault. And that wasn't their fault. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to this day, I think, in this area, um, therapists get about four hours of sexual assault in their, their training to become therapists. And we usually give it to them mm -hmm. now. But in, back in the day, um, they didn't really have any training on that. Um, and so it was really, on one level, very understandable that they felt threatened about now a group of women who may or may not have degrees, may or may not be up from a professional field, but they're respected, talking to them about rape trauma syndrome, which nobody had ever heard of. You know, saying to them, you need to understand the emotional reactions that a sexual assault survivor is experiencing from the beginning to the end, um, and you need to be able to counsel them on that and and that was you know it would probably be just like somebody else coming into our field and saying you want to know how you really should be a rape crisis center mm -hmm. you know none of us would be really receptive to that and they certainly weren't um, and so we were dealing with a lot of people who were seeking out therapy that were then coming to us with just being told the most horrific things 
Um, and so there, there had to be a lot of work and a lot of training done with therapists to kind of get them on board. And I have to say, you know, for some therapists still, that's a, there's a real threat there to them and they uh, don't uh, take what we have to say well where the majority of them, you know, we get calls on a daily basis from therapists who go, I have someone sitting in my office. She's a sexual assault survivor. What do you think about A, B, and C? So, you know, for the most part, they're responding, but we'll still have some, especially those new out of, you know, just getting their degree that would rather tout all of the letters after their name that you have been permission to go, you have this letter. Are there counseling programs within DOA? Yes. We offer, um, obviously, 24-hour counseling mm -hmm. through the, the crisis hotline. Mm -hmm. um, we do short-term in-person counseling on a one-to-one -one basis, and it's short-term because we are not therapists, we are peer counselors. Okay. So we offer up to 16 sessions, um, and then refer to therapists in the community that we have screened and know um, are good at what they do around sexual assault. Um, and then we offer support groups. Yeah. Were there secrets or tactics or strategies you employed to, that were successful that ad advanced your cause? You know, I don't think we really had any, any great secrets. Um, but I think the, the, the best tactic that we were able to use um, was our ability to listen. Mm -hmm. um, we were trained crisis counselors. <laughs> we were taught to listen. Um, and I think that because of that, we were able to listen to sexual assault survivors. We were able to listen to each other in the movement. And maybe even more importantly, we were able to listen to the people we were trying to um, convince needed to change their ways. We were able to listen to law enforcement concerns. We were able to listen to the court's concerns. We were able to listen to the hospital concerns and listen until we could find our commonalities. Hmm. Um, and when we could find our commonalities, then we had a place we could start working from that was not as threatening to them. Um, and I think we did that well. <laughs> Um, and I really do think that is what has put us where we are today. I mean, we have an amazing relationship with everyone in our county, um, amazing relationships with the courts, the poli every police department, and we have 16 police departments we're working with, all of the hospitals. Um, but that was a long, hard struggle to get there. Is that a characteristic of a mature operation, or is that uh, an evolution and an evolution of a process, or is that actually wisdom that, that people acquire working at something for a long time? I think it's wisdom that we acquire. I mean, yeah. you know, when I came on, and I was sitting in my first steering committee meeting, because like I said, we were a collective, um, and somebody at Oakland Police Department, a police officer at Oakland Police Department, had done something that just had riled everybody up. They had said something terrible to the survivor or whatever, and the first response out of almost everybody in this meeting was, let's go pick it. And I sat there and said, wait a minute, has anybody talked to that police <laughs> officer? You know, but I think it's all an evolution of, you know, you try what you try, and if you're wise, you uh, acknowledge what doesn't work and what only digs your holes deeper um, and what does work. So it certainly wasn't, a, oh, yes, we knew how to do this right from the beginning. Um, it was a long process of evolution, and I think we're still evolving. Hmm. What are some of the, what were, what are the, some of the failures that you see in um, victim services to uh, rape victims, sexual assault victims? I think when I think about where we have failed, and I'm speaking as we as a movement, not not we as they were. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we failed to respect ourselves sometimes. I think that we failed to um, acknowledge how much we really did know, um, how we really were the experts in the field. And because of that, I think some centers um, became, I don't like to say co-opted, but um, were, were forced to bend or to conform to more system-oriented formats and move away from their grassroots, community-based uh, birthing place. Um, for a while in California, there was this real push to institutionalize rape crisis centers. And um, some of them went that way, and they went that way for a variety of, in their minds, good reasons. You know, they could get more funding, they could get more respect, 
they could get, you know, whatever. Um, but I think in doing that, that some of, of the reasons why we started doing what we're doing was lost mm -hmm. um, and, and became much more system oriented. And I think that's a failure. I think when we move away from that grassroots um, base of support um, and diversity and commonality, um, that survivors start to lose some of what they need in support. Does that relate to the fact that you are peer counselors as opposed to bringing in licensed counselors who are trained to do sexual assault? Well, peer counselors are trained to do sexual assault. No, but I mean licensed. <laughs> sorry, I meant. Rephrase. I'm not sure what you're asking me. Let me rephrase me. it. Um, psychotherapists. Mm -hmm. um, psychotherapists who are then trained to do sexual assault as opposed to peer counselors. Or maybe you could just explain to me. I'm, I'm, I'm just not exactly sure what you're asking mm -hmm. me. Um, why are you asking why Bayward doesn't have trained therapists on staff? Yeah. Or? No, I'm I'm asking more. Does that connect to the idea that you are the experts and you are doing peer counseling and you are trying to stick with your grassroots? It does, but I also need to say there are other grassroots agencies that have trained uh -huh. therapists in them. I, I'm I'm talking more about when you get. Um, hooked into a system, like some centers that are hospital-based, some centers that are, you know, operating out of a police department or something like that. You know, it's hard to advocate for um, a sexual assault survivor if who you're trying to advocate against is paying your paycheck um, or has some other kind of control over you, like they're paying your rent. Um, and in, in that sense, I think that then that group is no longer able to adequately advocate um, for the sexual assault survivor, which is a huge piece of what I believe in the way that crisis centers are supposed to be doing. So you're making more just a general distinction between system-based and grassroots groups? Yes. So and I'm not saying that system-based groups are not doing good yeah. work, mm -hmm. but I think that, I think as a movement, when, when we started to go that way and some of us didn't go that way at all and some of us have pulled back out, I just think we lost some of the, the feminism, I think we lost some of the we lost sight of what we were doing um, and expanded or took on more uh, to be able to get the funds or whatever and lost what the heart and soul of a root crisis center was. And I'm just speaking very broadly um, as, I've s as I've witnessed the movement go, come and go and come again mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. throughout the years. Are there other areas that you um, would point out or is that pretty much what you're I, I think that's the main, I mean, I I don't think that we have really failed sexual assault survivors anywhere. I think that there's still a lot more we need to do. Um, I think we need to keep doing hard work um, to make sure and, and ensure that the services are always there all of the time um, to the degree that the survivor needs them. And, and in that respect, we have failed because that's not happening yet. Um, but when I look at where we started and to where we are, uh, you know, there's been leaps and bounds mm -hmm. in, in the amount of services that are provided statewide, county, uh, you know, countywide, statewide, nationally, to sexual assault survivors that weren't there before, so. Absolutely. Uh, what do you perceive as the one greatest accomplishment that's promoted victim's rights in your work? I don't really know. Um, I think there's been a gazillion accomplishments. Um, Two, three. <laughs> <laughs> but when, when I think, uh, you know, even when I came in, there were very little, if any, uh, protocols and procedures uh, in place on how um, sexual assault survivors should be interviewed, how they should be treated um, in that interview by law enforcement, um, medical needs of that survivor, um, evidence collection, um, you know, the whole variety of things that, that, that we now have in place, I think um, have bettered uh, things for a sexual assault survivor, um, and th those were not there. And so, you know, I see, I see all of those as, I see that as a primary accomplishment that, that we as an agency and we as a movement in this state have been able to uh, develop, and those were developed out of the struggles of keeping those <coughs> communications open and going and developing them. Um, so I, 
I think off the top that's probably the protocols, yeah. really good protocols. Protocols and procedures all the way across the board, you yeah. know, getting getting therapists involved and how they need to be working with sexual assault survivors and, and having procedures set up whether or not somebody chooses to enter into the system, um, that they are still, whether they want to make that report or not, that they're still receiving appropriate services across the board, um, as well as those that are in, entering into the system, um, ensuring that they're not being treated in anywhere near the same way they were treated um, when the young woman that got Baywar started was treated the way she was treated. What would you consider is really needed today to continue the growth and professionalism of the field? Um, a lot. <laughs> I think that um, we need to offer more continuing training. I think we need to offer more advanced training. Um, there's a huge turnover, at least in the state, with um, people who are in the movement. Hmm. and. So just about any training that you go to, it's like rape 101, uh, because three quarters of the room have been there one or two years in the movement. So I think we need to have more training. I think we have to have more staggered training so that wherever someone is within this movement, there is something new that they can learn um, and experience and thrive from and have something to take back. I think we need more ways of nurturing and mentoring um, new people who come into the movement. Um, I, this, as we all know, is an incredibly stressful, hard, hard work. Um, and I think that without building in um, our own policies and procedures <laughs> to ensure that people are being taken care of um, and, and that they're being heard in what their concerns are personally and professionally within the movement. I think that's one of the reasons we have such high turnover, and I think we need to be able, we need to start paying people what they're worth. <laughs>heard that question, the only thought that came into my mind was, get out. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> but I don't really mean that. Yeah. Um, run for the hills. Um, I think that um, to stay in this field, if you're coming into this field because you want to stay here and you want to keep doing this work, um, it's vitally important that you develop your own care packages, <laughs> that you um, take care of yourself, that you laugh, uh, that you you do things above and beyond the job. And you know, this, that's hard to do with this job because most of us, or a lot of us, are on 24-hour call. You know, you, you, you don't leave your work in the office. You go home and your phone's ringing because you're answering the hotline or your pager won't quit going off. So sometimes it can be really hard to find a way of separating yourself out and not living and breathing rape all the time. Um, so to find ways of setting your own boundaries, taking care of yourself, nurturing yourself, bringing humor into it, because without it, we'd all be dead. Um, and keeping focus, keeping focus on why you're there doing what you're doing. How do you keep the humor? How do you keep the humor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I gotta tell you, I, you know, I always get afraid of, you know, bugs in the office, because if people heard the sick humor that we <laughs> share with each other, um, that we would never share in the real world, um, you have to, you know, you have, this job is so bizarre, and what we work, you know, we said every day we go, we have the weirdest jobs in the world, mm -hmm. because you hear just the most atrocious, horrific things that have gone on in people's lives. And if you can't find some place to find the humor, not that there's anything funny about what has happened to them, but just in the bizarreness, or in the bizarreness of how you fit into the, s the scheme of things, um, I think you could literally go mad. Mm. Um, and, and, and I think that a lot of people don't keep the humor, and I think that they burn out really quick and they, and they need to leave. And, and, um, but I, honest, I honestly think, Baywar has a really long-term staff. We don't have much turnover. And I think that one of those reasons is that we, we laugh with and at each other uh, and try to ease the tension that way. And, and I think it helps us.
I think that being with groups of just victim advocates, I've been kind of in some among some of the funniest comedians I've ever met. <laughs> so. It's really called mental illness. <laughs> we try not to put that out too much. Um, do you have a vision for the future of the field? Um, not a great profound one. Um, just that it keeps going, that we keep doing the work, um, that we don't lose the original vision, um, that new people coming into the field remember that there were some amazing, amazing women before them, before me, um, who did amazing work to get us where we are. And I think a lot of the younger people coming into the movement never had to experience um, the feminist battles. <laughs> that some of us old folks had to endure and fought and, and, and fought in such a way that the new ones now coming in don't have to have those fights. And I'm glad of that. But I think it's important to remember. Um, I think it's important to go forward, but not without remembering. You are, um, the Bay Area is a very multi, there's a lot of diversity of uh, ethnic groups and religious groups mm -hmm. in um, the Bay Area. So you are still dealing with communities that are quite patriarchal and there are a lot of um, more traditional patriarchal treatment of women. Is mm -hmm. how, does, um, how does that factor into the services you provide at Bay Aware? It's, it, it causes a lot of problems um, in, in our ability to provide service. Um, within our training, we do, of course, cultural awareness training, um, try to um, get as much of a handle as we can on the variety of different groups of people that live within our communities um, and understand how sexual assault impacts them and, and how sexual assault relates within their communities. And we have, I can't even count the numbers of different groups of people that, that come into the Bay Area. Um, part of it's the through community education, getting out and talking to people, and I think even more so is building alliances with, with groups that are um, culturally specific, mm -hmm. um, who are from the communities in which they work and serve, um, and building alliances with them um, so that you know they're gonna be referring to us, we're gonna be referring to them, um, and we have so far to go. We have so far to go. Um, I think the more you can bring people into your agency that reflect the diversity of your community, the more then you have people to go back out and talk to the communities um, and start that education process. Um, but it's really hard, and it's really hard for the women who are experiencing sexual violence within those communities where sexual um, violence is um, unspeakable, um, where it brings humiliation and shame on the entire family or the entire community. Um, it takes some amazing, brave women who are willing to step out of that and come for help, um, but I think start the process of that change. Yes, for them, the feminist movement is, oh. is, hasn't been born yet. No, yeah. no, no. And, and, you know, there are, I mean, when you, when you watch women who come out of a community where they're really going totally against what their training is, you know, they're not keeping it within the family, they're not keeping it within the community, they're seeking outside help. I mean, I just sit there and I marvel at their courage. Mm. Uh, and, and each time someone is willing to do that, the more we start breaking down the barriers. Well, what, what's your greatest fear? What is my greatest fear? What would be fear? your greatest fear in, in your field? My, I don't fear that the field's going away. <laughs> I will hear, definitely here to stay. I think off the top, my, my biggest fear is that in the economical climate in which we are living now and in looking at maybe going to war, this or that or whatever, that, that we're gonna see a huge um, decrease in the funds that are gonna be available to do this work, um, which is going to, in the long run, uh, bring about probably a lot of loss of service. Um, and I think that, I, I fear that this movement will be one of the places that is first cut because um, I think they know we're not going away. And I think they know we'll just go back to our kitchen table. Um, and we'll just go back to being 100% volunteer based and we're not gonna stop or go away. And I think that, well that's good news, and we can all be very proud of ourselves for that, I also think that it's a disadvantage because I, I think that that's in the minds of a lot of people. Oh, we can cut them because they're gonna still do the work, but if we cut 
somebody who's relying on their $90,000 a year <laughs> salary, they're probably not going to still do the work. Sure. Um, so. And we were talking about taking care of yourself and health issues and mm -hmm. working 24 hours a day. That's mm -hmm. much harder when you're a volunteer. Much harder when you're a volunteer. Yeah. Would you say over the 30 years since this movement has really gotten going that attitudes have towards sexual assault have changed? Say a little bit about how they might have changed. I think they've greatly changed. Um, in the area where I am, um, we've just seen a huge turnaround in how people view the issue of sexual assault, how they view sexual assault survivors. Um, we have an amazing um, process within our county of, of, of combined effort through the SART program where um, we're all from our, all, all of the separate disciplines that have any uh, avenue in touching onto a sexual assault survivor have come together and are, are working 100% together in ensuring that that person is getting what they need. Um, so I think that in so many ways there's just been phenomenal changes in people's attitudes. And having said that, I can say I can still, you know, sit in a room of, of people and hear the most amazingly ignorant statements um, or when it comes more close to home for them how, mo how they're still very quick to blame the victim um, or the survivor um, and I get why they do that it's so they can put that barrier up and it won't happen to them but you know so we still see some of the same old stuff um, on, in on an individual basis um, but I as a whole um, I, I think that we've uh, all, all of us, all of the disciplines have done a phenomenal job in growing and changing and changing people's attitudes. Since you're in an area where there's so many universities and you do have a lot of volunteers from uh, universities working with you, uh, sort of in light of the, the, the recent National Women's uh, Study on Sexual Assault and what seems to be a very high level of sexual assault in schools, do you, um, do you have any particular focus on the academic institutions because of the presence of um, women volunteering? I mean, is there a special connection there, and is it effective? Well, we from from the get go mm -hmm. um, put special emphasis on schools. Yeah. Um, we have been in the schools from day one, um, so I don't think we have any more of a special emphasis there. It's every day we're in a school somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but we, yes, we have worked on building bonds and relationships with the universities um, and the health centers in the universities and the women's centers within the universities so that once again, I, I really believe the more we can collaborate, the more we can come together with all of our individual specialties um, and abilities, the better we're going to serve the sexual assault survivor, which is our agency's sole goal. Um, so the more we can outreach, the more we can collaborate, um, the better off we're going to be able to do our job. What's changed in the field since the beginning, since your time in the field? What are the, what are the changes that sort of strike you? Um, as I've already stated, I think, you know, vast differences in um, protocols and procedures and policies that have been developed um, to help ensure that sexual assault survivors are treated appropriately. I've seen a lot of laws that have come into place <coughs> that are ever evolving uh, to better the treatment of sexual assault survivors in the courtroom, to lengthen statute of limitations, um, whatever. Um, all, once again, an effort of trying to focus on the survivor as opposed to on the criminal. Um, I think I've also maybe seen some, some pulling away from feminist views and ideals, um, which is sad news to me. Um, those are, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned some, some of the early founders of Baywar, and um, since, since that time, have, have there been other people that have just been incredible mentors or, or leaders or people who have <coughs> really inspired you in your work? Um, there have been, and there have been many, um, many, many, and could I give you a name? Sure. Brain dead? No, I can't. 
the, the person who stands out the most in my mind now, who's been really influential and extremely a positive um, source of support for us over the last 10, 15 years, would be Nancy O'Malley, who mm. is the Assistant Chief Deputy District, Assistant Chief <laughs> District Attorney uh, for Alameda County. Um, and she is phenomenal. And she is an old rape crisis worker, hmm. not old in age, uh, was a, a volunteer in a rape crisis center many moons ago, um, and has always kept um, sexual assault at her heart. Um, and regardless of the variety of different jobs she's had within the DA's office, from running the sexual assault unit, which was great, um, to being where she is now, being second in command, um, she is always right there, and always a very loud, persuasive, um, person uh, standing up for, for the rights of sexual assault survivors and for the rights of sexual assault centers. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, she's, she's been a very strong guiding force. Great. Well, I've asked you several different kinds of questions. Um, is there an area or a topic related to this that you feel is really important that we haven't touched upon? I am. Um, I can't think of any. <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you, I think good? you all have done a good job of, of asking the question. Uh, I will get in my car, and as I'm driving home, I'll go, oh, should have said. Should have thought of that. Uh, should have, should have, but won't be, I'll call you. <laughs>